32. Jesus talks to the Pharisees and scribes about that kind of thing. Matthew 15. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father and mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells father or mother, Whatever support you might have had from me is given to God, then that person need not honor the father. So for the sake of your tradition, you may void the word of God. You hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Then he called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when you, they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also not without under, not are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles? For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defy. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. The relief of many <coughs> and the anguish of a few. School starts tomorrow. The new shirts will be placed by the bed alongside the new shoes. If they haven't been already, they'll be put out tonight. Lunches will be packed. Alarm clocks will be set for an unfortunate hour. <laughs> Parents who have been entertaining their children all summer will raise a glass of orange juice <laughs> to toast each other and to send their children off to school for another year. And those students, when they get to school, will be like runners with too many carbs built up in their bodies. Their bodies will be pulsing with energy as they run around looking to reacquaint with old friends, maybe make some new ones, and perhaps learn something as the year goes They'll use some of their energy to find their way, resettle. Many teachers are aware that their students are out of practice. So they will spend some time establishing some ground rules for what the year should be like. Expectations for behavior. Some parents, I wish there were more, some parents will have beaten the teachers to the punch. Those students will hear as they get out of the car or on the school bus parting words like, be good, mind your manners, remember who you are. Some might hear, act like you have some upbringing. <laughs> or at least, don't embarrass me. Parents plead for a good year, school and otherwise. What you notice in all this is there's no talk of academics. Soon enough, papers will be due and books will be read. But the first week of school is less about studying and more about learning. It's learning expectations for how we treat one another, for how we live in a society. That, it turns out, is a primary purpose of education. Education is less about standardized tests and more about life. Life happens in schools, and people are prepared for life in schools. Schools are a primary place where people learn to listen and understand. 
I like that phrase. Listen and understand. It's one that Jesus used when he was addressing the crowds. He was annoyed by the Pharisees and the scribes dismissing his disciples' devotion. They thought they knew something of the disciples' hearts by watching their hands. There was a tradition, not a requirement of the law, mind you, a tradition that said that faithful people wash their hands before they eat. The Pharisees and scribes imply by their question about Jesus' disciples that they somehow aren't faithful because they were caught not washing their hands in the proper way before they ate. Their observation does not impress Jesus. He turns their question on them and asks why they favor the tradition to the law. The law, not tradition, mind you, requires honoring father and mother. It's one of the ten big ones, but they allow people to break the law for the sake of tradition. Here's the evidence. There was a tradition that had developed that, say, if Junior grew tired of Dad, maybe they had some kind of disagreement. Junior could promise that which would have taken care of Dad in his old age to the church, to God. He could make a vow that these resources that were going to take care of you when you get older, I now give to God. Even if it didn't honor Father. If he made that vow, it was seen by tradition to trump the vow of the command. Jesus pointed out that this tradition, the Pharisees and scribes support of it, amounted to their approving someone breaking one of the Ten Commandments. And it just so happened to the benefit of the synagogues they ran. Worse especially for Dad in this case. Some suffered because of their godly words. Jesus, in essence, says, you know a lot of words about God, but you don't understand what they mean. You can say the words, but it's obvious they have no effect on you. Then Rabbi Jesus turned away from those he just criticized and spoke to the crowds, in earshot of those he just criticized, saying, listen and understand. I commission teachers to use that phrase. Listen and understand. It's the same kind of gravitas as when a parent says the full name. If Mrs. Hunsucker had turned to me and said, William Francis Malamity III, listen and understand, you can bet I would have sat up straight in my chair. <laughs> Because I would have known something was about to be flung at me, either physically or at least <laughs> verbally. Those crowds must have known that when Jesus said, listen and understand, something important, important was about to be said. It's the only time he uses that phrase together, listen and understand. There are times when he speaks of listening and laments those who won't understand. But here he says, listen and understand. It takes both, doesn't it? We first have to listen for us to get any benefit from what is being shared. But the benefit is lost if we don't understand. And we won't understand if we merely hear the words while we are attempting to come up with our counterattack to what has been said. Jesus knew the Pharisees and scribes might listen, but they wouldn't understand. They would hear him, but only through the filter of people busy developing a counter-argument. Not one to waste time, Jesus turns from the Pharisees and scribes to the crowds because they might listen. They stood a chance. They, they possibly would listen with understanding. They might not already be so committed to their argument that they could actually hear another perspective. And when Jesus launched in with listen and understand, they knew that what he was going to say would be big. So here's the big announcement. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles, it's what comes out of it. And that simple statement, Jesus cuts through the superficial in religion and gets to the heart of it. 
Now don't let your third graders, parents, and teachers tell you that Jesus is against hygiene. <laughs> That's not his point. Washing hands is good. What Jesus is opposed to is those who think that hygiene is somehow a greater sign of faithfulness than what's in our hearts. And what's in our hearts is known by how we treat others, not by how we treat our hands. Clean hands are about taking care of our bodies. Clean hearts are about taking care of others. We need both. But it is what we say to others and what we do for others that demonstrate our faith, not our clean hands. That's why Jesus ends his instruction, out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. You can do each of those things with clean hands, but you can't do one of those things with a clean heart. Listen and understand. It's not what goes in, but what comes out that defiles a person. Maybe at the beginning of a school year, it's not too great a stretch to say the same of our buildings. Our school buildings, church buildings, our homes. Listen and understand, it's not who comes into our buildings that defiles, but who goes out of them. You who will leave this building today, listen and understand. It's not who you were as you came in but who you are as you go out that matters. Educators, Sunday school teachers, youth and children leaders, parents, I don't mean to pile one more thing on your overflowing plates, but this is our calling. And I don't think you'd do what you do if you didn't agree. Our calling is to receive whoever walks in our doors without prejudice of who was born of what they look like, of where they've come from, or what others have warned you about them. We're called to receive them and teach them. We're called to form them into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now I know that for good reason, public school people can't use that phrase, likeness of Jesus Christ. You can say all day long, listen and understand, but can't once in the day say, because Jesus said so. I get that. You can't say it, but it doesn't mean you can't think it. Even if someone has no relationship at all to Jesus Christ, it does not mean that they cannot benefit from seeing His love, His compassion, and His teachings lived out every day. If you can model and push someone to have more of the character of Jesus by the end of this year, then he or she stands a better chance of exiting less defiled than he or she entered. I hope our school scores go up. I really do. Work on that. Help the students know more about every subject matter that is taught. But don't stop there. When they grow up, they might have a foggy memory of how to diagram a sentence. But they'll have been formed by how you cared for them. How you spoke to them what you said, and how you said it. They'll remember that they mattered to you. They'll remember that those things that came out of your mouth are so much better than what you put in it. How you are will have shown them the likeness of Jesus Christ. Or it won't. Let's pray it does. <coughs> you all have in your order of worship the blessing of the school year? Good, good, good. Well, I invite the children to come join me around these school supplies. And I invite all of you.